Let's start with Bitcoin. And when I say Bitcoin, I don't mean a single coin, but a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network of independent and autonomous Bitcoin nodes. The main question is what is happening inside a Bitcoin node when transactions are being processed by the Bitcoin network. In a simplified version, Bitcoin nodes maintain a list of transactions which they store inside a block. Once the block is full, it's linked to another block that also keeps a list of transactions. So together this will form the blockchain. Every node, of course, has to verify all transactions in all blocks. And when I said every node, I meant every node. So this yields at least two natural questions. What happens if a node cannot process all these transactions? And how many transactions can the network process at all? If a node cannot follow up, it cannot participate in the network. This means if we increase the amount of transactions per block, the network could scale, but only a few very powerful nodes could operate the network, which goes against the core idea of being a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network. Luckily, a group of people has come up with a solution to this, which is a protocol on top of the Bitcoin network, which is called the Lightning Network. Since our research is taking place on the Lightning Network, let's review the Lightning Network in a nutshell. It starts with two users, Alice and Bob, who create a payment channel by spending an unspent transaction output from a multi-sig address. Let's say this is 0.1 Bitcoin. So they create a so-called commitment transaction. It spends the output and it assigns 0.08 Bitcoin to Alice and 0.02 Bitcoin to Bob. It could be a different uh, set of outputs, but let's do this one. The commitment transaction is only known to Alice and Bob. It's not known to the Bitcoin network. It's completely in secret and thus it doesn't produce any load to the Bitcoin network. Of course, this transaction also is not being mined. Thus, we can double spend the multi-sig output if Alice was to send 0.01 Bitcoin to Bob. So they create a new commitment transaction, adapt the balance accordingly, and they forget about the old commitment transaction. And this forgetting process works via a smart contract. The multi-signature output is on-chain and public to the Bitcoin network. And the 0.1 Bitcoin, we call it the capacity of the payment channel. On the other side, the commitment transaction is only known to A and B. And we call the split of the outputs the balance. This is a private information. It is a well-known fact that payment channels can be connected to a network of payment channels. And a node can ask other nodes to route a payment along a path of payment channels from this node to a recipient. While the network topology with the capacities of the channels is public knowledge, the balance of the channels is not public knowledge. This means if I want to send a payment and I select a path of channels, I send out the payment and it might fail because a channel does not have enough funds to forward the payment. And this is of course not really great for a service level agreement and a high reliability of routing. Along this path, every node who wants to forward some amount of money has to have enough balance on their side of the channel. With that being said, I hand over to my co-author, Professor Mariusz Nowostowski, who will explain why the balance of payment channels actually have to be private. In the context of messaging and peer-to-peer -peer systems, there are two main important aspects to be considered. The first one is messaging overheads in general. Any reduction of messages that the nodes need to exchange with each other has direct impact on system performance its throughput and scalability in general. The second important aspect to consider is any reduction of information dissipation in the network has direct impact on the system resilience to abuse and attacks. It also improves the individual node's privacy. Not knowing the balance information is really tricky because we have to solve a pathfinding problem in the graph, but we don't know the balance information which we need to respect for our path to be found. As a solution, I propose that nodes always have a certain amount of balance on their side of the channel to be able to forward payments. In order to understand how we can do this, I want to review the just-in-time routing algorithm or JIT routing, which I proposed one year ago. So let's start with our sample path that we had. And the AB channel has a capacity of 0.2, the BC channel has a capacity of 0.3, and the CD channel has a capacity of 0.25. But remember, while the capacity is public knowledge, the balances are not public knowledge. So let's split the capacity of each channel. So in the AB channel, A has 0.015 Bitcoin and B has 0.05. In the BC channel, B has 0.2 Bitcoin and C has 0.1 Bitcoin. And on the CD channel, C has 0.05 Bitcoin and D has 0.2 Bitcoin. So we check that on the AB channel, A can forward the payment. On the BC channel, B can forward the payment. But on the CD channel, C cannot forward the payment. Let us now assume that C has another channel with a node E 
and E has another channel with node D. And those channels have a capacity of 0.15 and 0.3 respectively. And you can see how I distribute the balance on these channels. So with C now can't forward the payment of 0.1 Bitcoin, what it can do is it can send 0.1 Bitcoin via E and D back to itself. E and D are able on this channel in these directions to forward the payment. So let us now draw the rebalanced network because this circular payment, we call it a rebalancing payment. As you can see in this rebalanced triangle, the capacity stayed the same. They always stay the same, but the balances are now adapted accordingly. Let's look at the funds. The node C has 0.2 Bitcoin, the node E has 0.2 Bitcoin, and the node D has 0.3 Bitcoin. And the funds of these nodes are the same in each of these graphs. So nobody lost any money in this rebalancing operation. However, after the rebalancing operation, the node C has enough balance on their side to forward the original payment to node D. The node that needs to plan the rebalancing now needs to plan the entire path and it does need to know all the balances along the path. And what if this path doesn't exist? Yes, these are certainly valid concerns. But what I propose is that nodes start to share balance information with their neighbors. In this way, the neighbors can start to use this information to make better rebalancing decisions. René, stop! We don't want to share this information with everybody because the system will not scale, remember? Also, we want to maintain nodes' privacy. I know, that's why I explained it to the audience in the first place. I don't want to share this information with every node, but just with the neighbors. There's also different ways of sharing this information. You could do it proactively whenever the balance changes. Or you could have a query and a node would only respond with those channels that it also wants to have rebalanced. Yes, indeed. I see it as a very valuable trade-off. From one hand, we don't need to share this information with everybody in the network, which reduces the messaging overheads. On the other hand, the privacy is not compromised so much because probing balances of friends of friends is relatively easy to do anyway. Yes, exactly. But we should not forget that what I explained so far was the JIT routing case. What I suggest in this research is that nodes do the rebalancing proactively all the time in the background to be prepared when they are supposed to forward packages. Can you explain how this will be done and how the node will decide that it needs rebalancing? Sure. When it comes to rebalancing, most people think a channel is rebalanced if 50% of the capacity is on their side and 50% of the capacity is on the other side. So recall our example and this little triangle of channels between nodes C, D and E. If the capacity of the CD channel was split in a 50-50 way, both nodes would have a balance of 0.125. For node C, this would mean it has to have a balance on the CE channel of 0.075 and then E has to have the same balance. E would also have to have a balance of 0.125, then D would have to have 0.175 on the ED channel. And while the CD channel and the CE channel both are split 50-50, the ED channel is not split 50-50. Luckily, there is mathematics which can solve these kinds of issues. I would suggest to look at the relative amounts of funds that a node owns in a channel. With relative amounts of funds, I mean what is their funds compared to the capacity of the channel, which is always between zero and one. And what I'm saying is that a node should aim to have this number being equal across all channels it is connected to. Of course, as in the 50-50 case, this is not always possible, but then we can use a great measure from statistics, the Gini coefficient, to measure the inequality of these channel balance coefficients. And the Gini coefficient is obviously a statistical measure that is used mostly in economics to express inequality, for example, of wealth distributions. The real cool thing is that only with local information a node can compute the Gini coefficients and can decide how much liquidity they need to shift to each channel to minimize their Gini coefficients. That sounds really promising. Can you measure its positive effects? I can do that to some degree. I can work with the real snapshot of the Lightning Network. However, I have to assume how the balances are distributed in the beginning. As the balance of the channel is always on one side when the channel is opened, I did a random coin flip for the capacities of the channels to assign them to one side. And for that network, I computed the Gini coefficients, which you can see in this diagram. And you see the average Gini coefficient is about 0.5, meaning the channel balance coefficients are not very even. However, in the next diagram, we can see that the distribution of Gini coefficients 
shifts quite drastically. The Gini coefficients become on average much smaller and the median also decreases once every node tries to rebalance their channels. Of course, we should know if the difference in these histograms is actually significant. That's why I'm switching from the histogram to the cumulative distribution function of both these histograms and then we can measure the pointwise distance, which turns out to be 0.74. This is called the kolmogorov smirnov distance and we can see that there is really a huge difference in these two histograms. We have to be a little bit careful though. Of course, when I apply an algorithm to reduce the Gini coefficient of nodes, I should be able to see an overall decrease of Gini coefficients in the network. So the more interesting question is, how does the average Gini coefficient of the network relate to the ability of the network to route and forward payments? Luckily, this can be simulated. So I computed the cheapest path that exists between every pair of nodes in the Lightning Network. And then I measured the percentage of paths on which I'm not able to forward a single Satoshi payment. This, of course, I call the failure rate. In this diagram, we can see that the failure rate decreases once the Gini coefficient decreases. And we can see four lines in this diagram because I used four different strategies for the nodes to rebalance their channels, but the overall picture stays the same with each of these algorithms. Psst, there is a hidden assumption here. Of course, we are assuming that the likelihood between every nodes on the Lightning Network to conduct a payment is the same, which is obviously not true, but the best we can do here, as we don't know how money flows in the Lightning Network in reality. Seeing that the failure rate drops almost to zero is obviously a great result, but remember that was for a single Satoshi payment, which might not be the most useful thing. So I also computed the maximum amount that is possible to forward along each of these cheapest paths. And here in this cumulative distribution function, again, we can observe that on the balanced network with a low Gini coefficient, we can see that a much larger fraction of paths is actually able to forward higher amounts of payments, which is a really great result. In our last diagram, we can again see that the median of the maximum possible payment amounts is also increasing while the Gini coefficient is decreasing, indicating once more that the Gini coefficient here seems to be a really good measure for our goals. A link to the paper is in the description of the video and with that thanks to NTNU for making this research possible.